coming up on Aqua Kids. Head out with the Aqua Kids as they help rebuild a dwindling oyster population, explore a thriving oyster farm, and tackle the problem of excess nitrogen in our waterways. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. Hey everyone at home, and welcome back to another awesome episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. On today's show, we have a special treat in store. And what would that be, Drew? Not only do we get to take a boat ride out to an extremely successful oyster farm, but we also get to participate in graduate level research about nitrogen in our waters. That sounds awesome. I can't wait. Well, let's get going. The Aqua Kids arrived at the University of Connecticut satellite campus, Avery Point. We headed down to the docks in hopes to find Amanda, a PhD student studying the impacts of nitrogen in coastal waters. Hey, Aqua Kids. Hi. Hey. I'm Amanda. Nice I'm to a meet graduate you. student here at UConn, and today we're going to be talking about nitrogen and oysters. Um, so, as you probably know, nitrogen is an essential nutrient for all life. Uh, it's in DNA, it's in chlorophyll. All living things on Earth need nitrogen. But because of some uh, human activities like fertilizer use on our farms and fossil fuel burning and just general human population growth, we've increased the amount of nitrogen delivery to our coastal ecosystems so much that we now have too much of a good thing. And the nitrogen is actually causing some problems in our coastal ecosystems. We're seeing uh, eelgrass die off, uh, hypoxic and anoxic dead zones like the one you might have heard about in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, increased al harmful algal blooms like red tide and all of these things are harmful to our coastal ecosystems and often to human health as well. So you might see here an example um, in our just on our Yukon dock here if you want to come down and take a look. So, so you can grab that rake here and pull up see all this green algae here yep. that's floating on the top you can pull some up here. All right yeah so pick up that algae there that green algae pick it up. So this algae has, algae, macroalgae has been a really big problem here in New England because uh, as you see how kind of thick and matted that can become and yeah. these excess nitrogen inputs from human activities can cause the macroalgae to grow in large blankets over the surface of the water. Okay. And what can happen is this can shade out the naturally occurring eelgrass communities that grow on the bottom of, of the, of, on the bottom of the estuary. And so those communities without the light from the sun will, can then die from, and this is all a result of the macroalgae growing. And then eventually once the macroalgae does die, it can sink to the bottom and as it's decomposed, those bacteria that break down the macroalgae use up all the oxygen in the water and deplete the oxygen that would be there for other organisms to use. And that's another bad impact from the nitrogen inputs. So all of these, this nitrogen that humans put in just cascades down and causes bad, bad impact after bad impact after bad impact down the, and creates these negative effects for the whole ecosystem just from this one human source. Um, so, but luckily there are organisms that can perform what we scientists like to call ecosystem services that help scrub the nitrogen out of the ecosystem. What kind of animals are those? And so oysters are an example of these animals because they're filter feeders. They can take nitrogen and uh, organic matter, extra organic matter like algae from the water column, phytoplankton, and filter them out but as they eat. And so they can help improve water quality in the area. And so we're going to go over to an oyster farm that I work at and look at how I study the effects of oysters on nitrogen cycling in the coastal ecosystem. Cool. It's scary to think that human actions, such as putting fertilizer on our lawns, is causing such an issue in our waterways. I know. Too much nitrogen is not a good thing. But stay tuned to learn more about how oysters provide an ecosystem service by taking excess nitrogen out of the water. Aqua Kids will be right back. 
Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Ever dream of finding an oyster with a pearl inside of it? I know I have. What do you think the chances are of finding an oyster that contains a pearl? Is it A, one in a hundred oysters, B, one in a thousand oysters, or C, one in 10,000 oysters? Think you know the answer? I'll be back with the answer after the break. Were you able to guess the chances of finding an oyster with a pearl inside of it? The answer is C, one in 10,000 oysters. That's a lot of oysters. You'd be eating them for the rest of your life if you wanted to make a pearl necklace. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Let's head over to the oyster farm to learn more about nitrogen in the water. Cool, let's head out. So Katie, let's go talk with Steve who started this oyster farm here on Fisher's Island. All right, yeah, that sounds cool. Ooh, careful not to step in the cracks. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hey, guys. Hey. What's going on here? Well, this is a nursery system that we use for growing our small oysters. We have a hatchery back at our property on the cove where you guys came in by boat. Okay. And we grow the oysters there until they're about two or three millimeters, very Still tiny. Very tiny. Yeah. <laughs> and then from that hatchery, we move them up into this nursery system, which is actually called a flupsy for <laughs> floating upwelling system. And the oysters stay in this system until they're about a half an inch. And then once they're half an inch, we put them in nets. Uh, I've got a net over here I can show you. We put them in these nets. We put 250 in each of these nets. And then we hang them from these buoy lines. And we have 20 of these long lines of buoys. And the buoys that you see are just for flotation. Mm -hmm. So the oysters' seed will be in these nets hanging from the buoys and grows for the whole season. They stay in the pond here for the winter time. And then in the springtime, we harvest them. And most of what we grow in here, we sell to other growers. So why do you grow the oysters in these nets? Well, for, for a few reasons. Uh, pri primarily to keep them away from predators. Okay. Most of the predators that would consume the small, small seed mm -hmm. live on the bottom. And by having the oysters in captivity inside these nets, suspended from these buoy lines off the bottom, we keep the oysters away from the predators. And the other reason is because we want to have easy access to them. Mm -hmm. We want to, after a year, we want to be able to, to easily access all of the oysters that are in these nets and um, we end up sorting them by size and packing them in bags and shipping them out. If we had planted them on the bottom, if this bottom were capable of sustaining them, it'd be very difficult to get those oysters back. Hmm. The ones that survived the predation, that would happen to them. Before they go into those nets, you said they grow in these flupsies. How does that work? Well, let me show you. The, uh, we're probably best to go over here right. and look at the operation where we can see all the different parts of it. So if you look in here, you can see there's a pump. Oh yeah. There's a central trough in the center of each of these flupsies, and there's a hole in the end of the trough, and that pump is pushing water out of that central trough okay. through that hole. Hmm. The only way for water to come back into that trough is for it to come up through each of these, we call them silos. Okay. And if you look behind you, you'll see the silos have mesh on the bottom. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So by forcing the water out of the central trough, in essence, what we're doing is creating a flow of water up through each of these silos. Mm -hmm. And the flow rate is about 100 gallons a minute wow. that comes through Yikes. up through each of these silos. So when we start, we'll, we'll put a million oysters in each of these silos. A million. A million. And that will be about four liters. Mm -hmm. And that will be a layer that is maybe three eighths of an inch thick. Wow. And then as they grow, they can actually grow to fill up the silo. They'll grow right really? up to the bottom of those pipes. So wow. right now there are oysters in here that are about halfway through the flupsy process. And these are oh these are gosh. seed oysters that that are <laughs> about five millimeters, some of them bigger, a little bigger. And each week what we do is for every one of these silos we dump them out, 
we put all the oysters that are in these silos through a screen. We separate out the big ones and put the big ones in one silo, the smaller ones in another silo, clean off the screens, and then put the silos back in the water. What kind of water do they grow in? Well, this is actually a brackish water pond. The salinity right now is about 17 parts per thousand. That's about halfway between fresh water and the ocean. Huh. Okay. And that turns out to be very important because there are at least three oyster diseases that have ravaged the populations up the East Coast. Really? And those oyster diseases are not tolerant of low salinity water. Oh. So the pond being only 17 parts per thousand is in almost every season has been a refuge from those oyster diseases. So when we ship out seed to other growers, we have to have a pathologist look at the seed first and make sure that there are no diseases in mm -hmm. the seed before okay. it can get moved from our facility to their facility mm -hmm. so that we don't spread any diseases. And this pond, because the salinity is low, um, in this pond, the, the oyster seed almost always tests out clean. Hmm. So how have those diseases you've been talking about affected the naturally growing oysters over the past few years? The, uh, it, it actually dates, dates back more than 50 years when, oh, wow. when a couple of those diseases were first discovered. And the first populations that they impacted were in Delaware Bay. Mm -hmm. And they just wiped out the bay. Wow. And then the Chesapeake, and then those diseases slowly moved north up the coast. And this far north, it's, we're really at the, uh, the northern edge of the distribution of some of those disease organisms based on water temperature. Mm -hmm. You'll find those diseases in Maine, but when you find them in Maine, it's in areas where the water temperature is about like it is around here. Okay. Right. In Long Island Sound, because we're at the northern edge of that distribution, the effects are variable from year to year. And oftentimes those effects will last a period of five or ten years, and then there won't be an effect for five or ten years. Hmm. The, uh, the last major effect in Long Island Sound that really took out most everything was in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay. Now, where do all the oysters go after they've spent a year here in the pond? So in March, next March, what we'll do is we'll harvest all these oysters. Mm -hmm. And half of our business is selling seed to other growers. We have 50 or 60 other growers that depend on our seed for, for stocking their farms. 90% of, of what you see out here will get sold to those other farms and about 10% of it will get stocked into our final grow out system which is out in the harbor. Okay. It's a different grow out area that we use for the second and final growing season. Let's go over to the other side there and talk to Amanda about the research that she's doing. Cool. All right. Hi guys. Hey, hey Amanda. Amanda. So now that you've seen that farms like Steve's are starting to rebuild the oyster populations here in New England, uh, I'm going to tell you about a little bit what I'm interested in, and that's how the oysters are affecting the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I've been looking in the sediments because once the oysters filter out the nitrogen and organic matter, that what do they do with it? They're either going to take it into the, their biomass as energy, they're going to use it for fuel, food, or they're going to deposit it into the sediments. And so that's what I look at, the sediments. What a cool oyster farm. It was great to see that people like Steve are helping to rebuild the oyster population. And not just for food, but also for ecosystem services. Very true. Don't go away. When AquaKids comes back, we get to check out some of Amanda's research. Welcome back. I'm ready to dive into this research. Let's get going. <laughs> All right. Here in Salina, we're here in the bay site of the oyster grow out. And you can see the nice oyster floats behind me where the lantern nets are hanging. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you how I sample the bottom of the bay uh, to look at the different nitrogen cycle processes that are happening and how the oysters are helping to uh, aid the microbes in removing nitrogen from the ecosystem. Okay, let's do it. Awesome. Okay, so we have this big long pole. It's a 10 foot PVC pole core. And you can see on the end here, there's a core that has a beveled edge, and that's gonna help it dig into the bottom and hopefully take a core for us. So I'm gonna go right next to the boat here and go down to the bottom. 
And here I've hit bottom, so now I'm just gonna dig into the bottom and then pull up. There we go. And you can get ready to cap the bottom. Put it right on there. And we're gonna pull it right up into the boat. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, you two grab the pole, hold it tight. Okay. Here, you, you get up and grab the pole and I'll work on the bottom. All right. Give me just a second. Push down. Yeah, <gasps> there we go. <laughs> Start tilting the pole this way. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, well that was. All right, oh, that worked. <laughs> Got okay, on. now we have a beautiful core. Okay, so now that we're back on the dock, we're gonna take some samples from these great cores that we took earlier today. And here to help us is Emily, our Aqua Kids guest. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Hello. Um, okay, so you can see some pretty big differences here between these two cores. This core is the core from the Harbor uh, Oyster site that we took earlier today. And this is the core from that I took yesterday from the pond site, uh, the pond oyster site. And you can see that there's some pretty big differences, especially in the sediment here. Um, this one is sandier, right? Mm -hmm. And this one is what we call silty, or which is basically just muddy. Uh, and that's because all of the oyster deposits uh, in the pond basically just fall right to the bottom. There's very little flow, uh, water's not moving very much, so it pretty much just stays put. But in mm -hmm. the harbor, those oyster deposits might fall to the bottom, but there's a lot of wave action, a lot of water flow, and so it's yeah. gonna get moved around and moved mm -hmm. elsewhere. So that's why the water is more clear. Exactly. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take some subcores, and this is a technique that I will often use uh, to get an idea of what kind of uh, nutrient dynamics are happening within the pore spaces of the sediment here. Mm -hmm. All right, let's give it a try. So I've kind of stirred this one up a little bit, so try to find where it starts. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then get your other hand. I like to kind of put it like this, you know? Mm -hmm. Kind of like this. Yep. And then push down and pull up at the same time. All right, so now that we have our extra nerdy safety yeah. glasses on, yeah. they're beautiful. I know. We are going to flash freeze our subcores. So here we go. Okay. Okay. That's so cool. Now. Oh my gosh. This should be nice and cold. Okay, so now we have a frozen sediment section mm -hmm. that we can fold up in our tin foil and take back to the lab for sectioning and for nutrient analysis. So how important is the study to water bodies in general? Well, so for example, in Long Island Sound, um, having the oyster population coming back and having an understanding of how the oysters are influencing the nitrogen budget is really important because, you know, human population is, uh, is still increasing and we continue to pretty much uh, increase or stabilize the amount of nitrogen that we are inputting to mm -hmm. these water bodies. And so, but we still don't really have a good handle on exactly what that nitrogen uh, can always do to these water bodies. And so a lot of people are looking into using uh, oysters and other bivalves like oysters yeah. and mussels and things like that to cleaning up the waterways and improving water quality. Uh, but it's important to know what they can do on a, on a nutrient level. And so I'm hoping with this study that we can uh, improve our understanding of that. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be back in a minute. Here's our top story. Gulf oyster harvest dealt a serious blow. We've never seen it like this. Not out here, sighs fisherman Randy Slavich. Slavich, an oyster farmer in the Gulf of Mexico, points out a serious issue plaguing the Gulf Coast. Oyster harvests have declined dramatically in the past four years following the BP oil spill. In fact, experts have found that oyster population sits at less than one third of the pre-spill harvest. Whether the oil spill caused the loss of oyster habitat and larvae is still under investigation, but fishermen and biologists are fearing the worst. If it turns out that the oil spill is the culprit, the question becomes, how can we get the pre-spill population back? 
I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for today's show, but I had so much fun out on the boat at the Fisher's Island Oyster Farm. It sure looked like it. It was so interesting to learn about how oysters take up extra nitrogen in the water by feeding. Right? I also thought it was cool to see all of the work that Steve, Pete, and Amanda were doing to reestablish oyster populations around New England. Absolutely, Katie. Their work helps us to remember that everyone can do their part to help keep our planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journey. And learn how you can come along with us, so together we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua Kids. Kids.